the NFL and You podcast. Welcome to the NFL and You podcast. I'm your host, as always, Hayden Vassar, welcoming you to week three of the NFL. Uh, yeah, we got off to a great start last night, didn't we, with the Thursday Night Football game. Wow, what magic that was. Just pure bliss. That That's what that was. So, today we're going to recap what happened last night. Uh, we're also going to preview the rest of week three and tell you what to look for, what to watch out for, that sort of thing. And we're going to catch you up on any news that's happened since Tuesday. Uh, but first we're going to jump into the Jags victory over Tennessee last night, 20 to seven on Thursday night football. And, uh, I'm going to be brutally honest with you guys. I did not watch this game. Uh, right before kickoff, a friend of mine named Chance called me, and that's going to be important here in a second, and I'll tell you why. He called me, and we talked throughout the majority of the game, so I w- really wasn't paying attention. But during the phone call, he offhanded, once we were talking about football in the NFL, he mentioned that the, he felt, that the, Chance felt that the Tennessee Titans offensive line is the worst in the league. And I immediately countered with what I thought was true, that the Houston Texans line is, in fact, the worst. But after what happened last night, after Marcus Mariota, the Titans quarterback, gets sacked nine times in a game. Nine. I think Chance is right. I think the Titans might be the worst offensive line. Here's an interesting tidbit. Last night, when Mariota was sacked nine times, that was the second most he's been sacked in a single game in his career. Can you guess the first? It was last season, in week six, right? I think it was week six. Yeah, week six versus Baltimore last year, where he was sacked 11 times. 11 That is atrocious. And I didn't think there was a team that could be worse than the Texans at protecting their quarterback. I was wrong. I was very, very wrong. Get this. Going into last night, Mariota had already been sacked eight times in the first two games. Four a game. They were averaging four sacks a game going into last night. Then he gets sacked nine times. That means he's been sacked 17 times already this year. 17. That's seven more than Deshaun Watson at 10. That is absolutely atrocious. And it's the main reason why Tennessee lost this game. They could not block anything. Go back and watch parts of this game. You can see the moment the ball is snapped, there are already defenders in the backfield. Mariota has no time. Because you could argue that if you want to negate the pass rush, start getting the ball out quicker. He can't get the ball out quicker if he's already getting hit by the time the ball is snapped. He just can't. That's physically impossible. So Mariota had a rough night. And even when he wasn't getting sacked, you would think that bad weather, it was raining throughout the majority of the game. You would think that it would be inducive of running games to really, you know, help their teams out. But neither running back had a good night. Derrick Henry, I think, had like 40 yards and a touchdown. And Leonard Fournette had a grand total of like 60 yards. I mean, Marcus Mariota threw 40 passes last night in a rainy Jacksonville Thursday night game. That just doesn't make sense. It feels like it's more indicative to run the ball. Um, Like I said, Mariota completed 23 of 40 passes for 304 yards. Most of that was when... The game was well out of hand. I mean, this was Jacksonville from the get-go. And sacked nine times. And even when Mariota wasn't getting sacked, he was missing open throws. I remember there was that when they got into the red zone, I think it was in the second half, and he missed, I think it was Delaney Walker alone, wide open in the end zone. He just sailed it. And I know Mariota was running when he did it, but, I mean, come on, man. It does not get more open than what Delaney Walker was in that end zone. And uh, 
I just want to throw this out there because I know I've heard it said a couple times. Uh, if anybody else was watching the Thursday Night Football pre-show, I had it on in the background while I was playing on my phone. And they did that thing where they put player A stats and player B stats up side by side, but they won't tell you which player is until like the very end of the segment. And I'm telling you, these two player stats, they're two quarterbacks. They're virtually identical. Touchdown interception ratio, win percentage, all of that. I'm talking within 0.01% of each other. It's virtually identical. And then they reveal who the two quarterbacks are. You know who they are? It's Marcus Mariota and his backup, Ryan Tannehill. That is not good. That's literally saying there is no difference between if you put in Ryan Tannehill from a stats perspective. I And I saw a lot of people on Twitter uh, demanding that the Titans start Tannehill going forward. And I get that frustration because it's been five years with Marcus Mariota. But you got to remember, for a lot of those years, Mariota had a new offensive coordinator almost every single year, so everything is constantly changing. He never had a chance to really grow. And his offensive line is always trying to get him killed. So yeah, while Mariota has never really grown, and you can blame him for that, you also have to blame the organization for never really trying to let him grow. They've, they've always had a constant coaching shuffle, shuffle, and that can always stunt quarterbacks. I think that's what's happened in Tennessee. Uh, I, I do think if Ryan Tannehill starts, I think it could be worse. For the Titans. Not because I think Tannehill's a bad quarterback, but they're almost two different people. Uh, you look at Tannehill, he's more of a pocket passer. I really don't remember him being mobile in Miami while he was their starter. And you got Mariota. Well, not, he's not a guy that's going to you know rush for 100 yards a game. He's just not. His mobility is helping him survive in that backfield. And... If you just put a pure pocket passer back there who can't run and can't scramble, nine sacks could become like 13. I'm just throwing that out there. So we're going to keep an eye on the Mariota Tannehill. Uh, I guess I guess now it's becoming a quarterback competition because Mariota is proving he can't consistently win. And Tannehill really can't either. That's the reason why he's not the starting quarterback in Miami anymore. Besides the blatant tank job they're doing. Uh, so we're going to keep an eye on that with Tennessee. But looking at Jacksonville. Jacksonville completely changed my expectations of them in one game. Gardner Minshew is fun. He's flat out fun. Minshew mania is real, people. And... I really, I was ready to write the Jacksonville Jaguars off as dead. They were 0-2, looking to be 0-3 if they had lost this game. And your star defensive player is saying he wants a trade. I, it just felt like it was getting ready to crumble. But Gardner Minshew goes out, starts really great. Two uh, beautiful touchdown throws in the first quarter. And he's just looking great. Th this kid can play. He's not going to, you know, light it up for 300 yards and three touchdowns, mind you. He's he's not going to do that, but he's given this team a chance to win. He's he's brought the Jags back from the dead and all of a sudden the Jags are sitting there with one win and the entire rest of the AFC South is sitting there with one win. So the the Jags are right back in the thick of it in the AFC South. Their defense is solid and we're going to talk about Jalen Ramsey more here in a second, but the Jags are very much still alive in this division. And Minshew's going to lead them. And that city's in love with him. That coaching staff's in love with him. Everybody is seemingly in love with Gardner Minshew. And I'm one of them. That, that kid is entertaining. I love his personality. Just because it's so funny. It's fun. The NFL is having fun. And that's something you don't hear very often. They're having fun with this one player. And it's great. Um, so yeah, Jag, each team at the end of this game is one and two now. Uh, the rest of the division already has one win apiece. Colts have one. Texans have one. We'll talk about them more later during the preview portion. Jags are still alive, and the Titans, who started out with that great win in Cleveland week one, <clears throat> have now lost two straight. The heartbreaker to 
Indy last week and now just getting flat out dominated by Jacksonville. Nine sacks. Calais Campbell, the, a Jags defender, had three sacks on his own. So there you go. It's, it's not good in Tennessee right now. Things are very not good. Twitter hated this game, by the way. Just scrolling through Twitter during the game. People hated this game. Tom Brady tweeted that he turned the game off. Because it was so bad. Because there were so many flags in the first half. It was bad. It was. It just was not good football. It just wasn't. I bet it was good for Jacksonville, you know. Beat a division rival. I bet that was nice. But other than that, it really wasn't that interesting of a game. Alright, moving on. We're going to talk a quick bit about Jalen Ramsey real quick. As you know, the star defensive player for the Jags asked for a trade earlier this week. And um, it sounds like, according to every NFL insider that has talked about it so far, that Friday, today, is the target date if a trade's going to happen. Uh, the Jags have apparently asked for something in the ballpark of two first-round picks and maybe more for him, something alike into what Khalil Mack got when he got traded a year ago. But then you also have to think if he gets traded, he wants a new contract too. He wants money. <clears throat> so you have to find a team that's basically willing to forego two years of their future and eat a big bullet on salary cap to get a guy like Jalen Ramsey, who can very much still play. He can still play and cover at an alarming rate how good this guy is. Even if he talks off the field and he's got a bit of an ego, that guy can flat out play. And um, it's uh, right around 11 o'clock Eastern right now, and so far there's been no trade talk. Uh, there was a report about half an hour ago that the Jags owner, Shad Khan, is willing to break the bank to keep Jalen Ramsey there as long as it doesn't kill the team's cap space. It sounds like the Jags want to keep Jalen Ramsey. I just don't know if Jalen wants to stay in Jacksonville. Because after the game last night, because he played last night, he played the entire game, which was kind of surprising for a guy who's about to be traded. He played the entire game, and then after the game he said he di just didn't want to talk about trade stuff. He didn't want to talk about it. And I kind of, I kind of took a step back and I'm like, maybe he won't get traded. There, there's the possibility that he doesn't get traded, that the Jags just go, listen, we don't care that you want out, you're staying here and playing. And of course that's going to ruffle a lot of feathers, but... That's a possibility that that could happen. It could also come out that by like 2 o'clock he's gotten traded to the Kansas City Chiefs. Oh boy, that would be scary. Oh Jesus, that's scary. So like I said, we'll, we'll keep an eye on this going forward. But as of right now, Jalen Ramsey is still a Jacksonville Jaguar at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Uh, and Jacksonville is apparently asking for an entire arsenal of draft picks for him. So we'll keep an eye on that and just keep you updated on it. We'll see what happens if or when Jalen Ramsey gets traded. All right, moving on. We're going to jump into the preview portion. We're going to preview the rest of week three. And we're going to start out with a bye game. Uh, not a bye game. A team that's on a bye this week. The Dallas Cowboys. Oh, no, they're not on a bye. They're just playing the Dolphins. This is going to be a bloodbath. Oh, good God, this is going to be a bloodbath. The Dolphins are in full tank. They're going on the road, and they're starting Josh Rosen. I like Rosen. I, li I really think that kid's gotten a lot of unfair hate through the entirety of his NFL career. It felt like some people are just hating on this poor kid to hate on him. Uh... And then he just gets, like, horrifically sabotaged by some higher power. I mean, he gets drafted by the Cards, who never really felt like they wanted him to begin with, even though they traded up for him. There's a constant coaching carousel throughout his rookie year in the offensive coaching department. Then they dump him because the new head coach fancies the young Kyler Murray instead. So they dump him, 
to the Dolphins, who are doing the most blatant tank job the NFL has ever seen and are on pace to have the worst scoring margin in defeat of any NFL team ever. Ever. I read an athletic article the other day that said if the Dolphins average a margin of defeat by about 14 points for the rest of the season, they will statistically be the worst team to ever play. That's bad. We are seeing tanking at an historically bad level. This team could seriously not win a game this year. And they're going in to play a Dallas Cowboys team in Dallas who is hitting on every single cylinder right now. Their defense is solid. Their offense is averaging over 30 points a game. Their quarterback is making a serious case to be one of the highest paid players in the league. The Dolphins are going to probably walk into another 45 to nothing buzzsaw here. And it came out Wednesday that they're going to start Josh Rosen. And Josh Rosen isn't going to fix what's wrong with this team. Now keep in mind, the Jaguars team, the players, and the coaches are trying their darndest to win. They're trying hard to win. It's the front office that's making sure that this team doesn't win. And it feels odd to have these two things at odds with each other. But that's what's happening. The front office wants this team to tank for a quarterback, and his name is Tua Tugavailoa from Alabama. Is who it sounds like the Dolphins are in love with. Um, but looking at Dallas, I think this is the right week to play a team like Miami. Uh, Xavier Woods and Michael Gallup are out. We talked about this on the last podcast. Xavier Woods out for four to six weeks uh, due to an ankle injury, and Gallup had arthroscopic knee surgery, so he's out for two to four weeks. But this is coming into a nice little sweet spot in the schedule for Dallas. They got uh, Miami now, then they're going to have the Jets soon, presumably without Sam Darnold. We're going to talk about them later. Uh, The Saints without Breeze. This is a nice little sweet spot, and the Cowboys could be a team that's like 5-0 here in a couple weeks because they're playing some teams that are not good right now. Not like they're bad but that they're not in a good place right now and the Dolphins are just one of those teams Dolphins have been outscored 102 to 10 so far only one touchdown so far for the Dolphins and Fitzmagic is on the bench and it's Josh Rosen time the Rosen one so hopefully he has a bit better of a start I don't think it will affect anything and the Dolphins are probably going to go 0-16 but Dolphins fans, remember this pain. You got three first-round draft picks this year and two next year. Remember this pain when you're reloading your entire roster. It'll be worth it. I promise you that. Cowboys win this one big. And we're going to move on to our other team on a bye this week. Oh, no, it's just the Patriots playing the Jets. Oh, I got you again. Uh, Jets at Patriots, uh, 0-2 Jets versus 2-0 Patriots, and this looks to go the same way the Dolphins-Cowboys game goes. Jets on their third-string quarterback. It sounds like Luke Falk on a short week is going to get the nod. Their third-string quarterback. Uh, And Bill Belichick is probably going to cook up every defensive blitz he has ever thought of just for this poor kid. Uh... Uh, will C.J. Mosley play, the defensive linebacker for the Jets? I mean, that could at least keep the game kind of close, maybe out of the 40s for the Pats offense. Yeah, he didn't play last week after, I think it's a knee injury that he suffered in the first game against Buffalo. Uh, Adam Gase, the Jets head coach, said that Darnold could be back by week five. Uh, we'll see about that. It sounds like his spleen is still enlarged because he's got mono. 23-year-old man in the NFL has mono. By the way, did anybody watch the Monday Night Football game and see the graphic with Sam Darnold where he was out with mono? You know that they filmed this graphic like months ago, but he's doing the whole hero point thing in slow motion. It just says, Sam Darnold, out with mono nucleo. Mono. <laughs> just out with mono. And it's like the most Jets thing ever. <laughs> it's so bad. 
Anyway, uh, the Pats' defense is for real, and it might be one of the top three defenses in the league, if not the best. Pats win this one big, and things are just going from bad to worse for them, for the Jets. Oh, boy. Pats are good. Pats are great. Probably winning the Super Bowl. All right, moving on to our next game, an actual competitive game. Bengals at Bills. Uh, it's the Bills' first home game because they spent the first two weeks on the road. 2-0 Bills taking on 0-2 Bengals in Buffalo. Uh, the Bills' D is for real. It's very for real. Very stingy. And the Bills are the best team in New York. Like, by a long shot. Like, it's not even close. I know the Giants got all the fanfare this week for what they did at quarterback. But the Bills are the best team in that division. I mean, in that entire state. City. Whatever you want to call it. New York, your best team is the Bills. Uh, they're still figuring things out offensively. You can tell when watching them because they're not an offensive juggernaut. They're more like an offense that's probably going to score 20 points and that'll be their limit. But that defense can realistically hold you to like 14 points. Realistically. Uh, I like the Bills. I, I think their wide receiver core got a little bit of a makeover with you know adding Cole Beasley and some other guys. Give Josh Allen somebody to throw to. And Josh Allen's starting to come into his own. Still got an absolute cannon and tends to put a little too much heat on the ball, but he's starting to come into his own. Uh, for the Bengals, though, if you remember, if you were listening a week or two ago on this podcast, I really wanted to like the Bengals. I, I, I really wanted them to be fun. And they had a fun week one, and then they had a not-so-fun week two. Uh, so, I guess week three, they're going on the road. We're going to find out, I guess, what bangles we're going to get going forward. Are we going to get fun bangles, or are we going to get not fun bangles? I want fun bangles. Fun bangles makes it interesting. Uh, but after watching them for two weeks, I think we kind of understand how their offense is going to work. Uh, they're going to be more pass happy, and you've seen that in the past two games. Uh, first game, Andy Dalton threw for a career high and over 400 yards. Second game, he had 300 yards at a very losing effort. But because they've become so pass happy, uh, their running back, Joe Mixon, who is hurt but is probably going to play, has been left out in the cold. Uh, 17 rushes for 27 yards. That's his entire stat line for the entire season so far. He's averaging 1.6 yards a carry. That's really not good. The, the Bengals have to get him more involved, but for the Bengals, it sounds like they just want to throw the ball under Zach Taylor, the new head coach who was coming from a Sean McVay in L.A. situation. you got to remember, Zach Taylor, their head coach, I think he was like the quarterback coach in L.A., so he, he wasn't even an offensive coordinator. He wasn't calling plays. This is his first year doing any of this, so... It, He's going to take some time to learn and understand how to work all of this. But for the Bengals, all I ask, all I ask, Bengals, please be fun. Please make it watchable. Don't get blown out 40-13 to 13 again. Please. I want to like you. I really want to like you. I got the Bills winning this one, though. Bills are the best team in New York, and they're making the AFC East interesting. Because we, I thought coming into the season it would be the Jets, maybe get a wild card, maybe go 8-8. Eight eight. But the Bills the Bills have taken over that position now that, you know, the Jets have completely fallen off the face of the earth. Moving on, next game up, uh, the 0-2 Broncos. Oh, boy. Going all the way across the country to take on the 2-0 Green Bay Packers. This looks to be like a very run-heavy matchup. Both these teams want to run the ball. We know what Matt LaFleur wants to do in Green Bay. He wants to set up a run that can take pressure off of Aaron Rodgers. And that's what they want to do in Denver. They want to take up, they want to set up the run to where Joe Flacco doesn't have to throw 50 passes like he did last week in a losing effort against Chicago. Uh, like we mentioned last uh, Tuesday on the podcast, a lot of times... Uh, will the Packers' offense still be a Jekyll and Hyde machine 
where they look really promising at one point, and then they just look, what is this the next? Because remember, they scored 21 points in the first half last week against Minnesota, and then there was absolutely nothing after that. I, I just want to see a complete game from the Packers' offense, not just a half. Because if you only really show up for a half, that's how you lose football games. Uh, the Broncos desperately need a win. They lose this game, they're 0-3. And they're going across the country to take on one of the greatest quarterbacks ever in Aaron Rodgers, who has help from a running game, who has help from a defense that is really good right now, and, and Mike Pettin knows what he's doing with that Green Bay defense. And the Broncos are going there with Joe Flacco uh, and a defense who is the only defense in the league who is yet to get a sack. I know we talked about this on Tuesday, but it bears repeating. The Broncos are the only team in the league who do not have a quarterback sack going into week three. Everybody else has sacks. And I checked the stat again the other day just to make sure. Sacks. Everybody else has sacks. Plural. Broncos have zilch, nada, zero. And that is inexcusable with the talent they have on that defense and with Vic Fangio coaching them. That is inexcusable. Uh, I, I, I do wonder, though, since they're going across country and how the last Broncos game ended with them getting screwed, they did get screwed, by officiating in that game against Chicago, and I really think it did affect the outcome. You got to wonder, are the Broncos going to still be hung up on that game? We've seen it happen in the past where teams are still thinking about how they got screwed in a previous game, and then they sleepwalk into a road game and walk straight into a buzzsaw. Uh, I, that's why I'm personally worried about for the Broncos. Uh but for them to win this game, they have their defense has to step up. It has to. It needs to do more than just keep a game close and stop the Packers from scoring 20 points. They need to do a lot more than that. They got to hit Rodgers. They got to get sacks. They have to. Right now is a do or die moment for the Broncos and whether they can try and salvage their season because once it gets to 0 and 3, you you might as well start writing them writing them off. It's already hard enough to come back from 0-2. It's, it's, it's even harder to come back from 0-3. Because you got to think about it. They play in the AFC West. You know who resides in the AFC West and who they have to play twice this year? The Chiefs. And the Chargers. Those are four games that they probably lose. And you add that on to 0-3, that probably already makes them 0-7. So they basically have to win, what, every other game to realistically get a shot at playoffs? It's not good in Denver right now, and it's going to get worse after the Packers win, and that's what I think is going to happen. Packers win this one, go to a 3-0, and and the Broncos are going to fall to 0-3, and and it's just not going to be good in Denver. Oh, oh boy. All right, moving on to our next game. I think this is going to be a very fun game. I think this is a game people should watch early on in the 1 o'clock Eastern time slot. Falcons at Colts. Two 1-1 one one teams going at it. The time is right now for the Atlanta Falcons. Right now. This is their moment. Drew Brees is out for six weeks. You've got an opportunity to really uh, just take over the NFC South right now for the Atlanta Falcons. Start winning games, start building a lead in that division, and just hope that the Saints can't figure it out with Teddy Bridgewater. That should be what the Falcons are absolutely hoping for right now. Uh, I know that the Falcons didn't have the best offensive game from Matt Ryan. I think he threw like three picks last week. Uh, but their passing attack has been one of the best in the league so far. And they're going to Indianapolis to take on a Colts rushing attack that has been lethal so far, and that's what's been carrying that offense. Marlon Mack, their running back, uh, is third in the league with rushing with 225 yards. That's what it's been for the Colts. They've been just been running the ball relentlessly against teams. And we're going to see how healthy Marlon Mack is. I saw last night that he's got a calf injury, 
and they're keeping an eye on that, and it makes sense that he's got a calf injury because he's been carrying that team. Uh, Jacoby Brissett, he's he's not a world beater. He He's averaging less than 200 passing yards a game so far. But he's given the team a chance, and that's all you can ask for him. And I, I'm going to keep saying that about every backup because there's like eight different backups playing right now. Uh, I do think, though, that this game is going to kind of be decided the same way the Jacksonville-Tennessee Thursday night game was. Because the Colts so far have eight sacks. They've generated eight sacks so far this season. And if you've been watching any of the Falcons so far, you know that their offensive line is banged up. It's hurt. So this could be a game that's decided in the trenches, even though it feels like it's probably going to be an offensive slugfest that comes down to who has the ball last. Uh... And then looking at, speaking of the Colts' defense, their all-pro linebacker, Darius Leonard, who still in concussion protocol from last week, uh, has missed all the practices so far, and it sounds like he might not be able to go, which is a huge blow to that defense. When Darius Leonard is healthy and playing, he is one of the most effective uh, defensive linebackers in the entire league. If I remember correctly, didn't he win Defensive Rookie of the Year last year? I think he did. I could be wrong. But he deserved to win it, I'm going to be honest. Uh, so, like I said, he's still in concussion protocol, so we'll keep an eye on if he's able to go. But I think an underrated storyline for the Colts so far that not enough people are talking about is Adam Vinatieri. Remember last week after the Titans game, he missed a couple more kicks, and he told reporters that you'll see him on Monday, he'll talk to you guys, even though there wasn't a scheduled press conference, which made a lot of people think okay, Adam Vinatieri is going to retire. The 24-year-old future Hall of Famer is going to retire. And apparently Frank Wright got a hold of him, and upper management got a hold of him and said, listen, we don't want you to retire. They, they apparently still believe in him. I think he's missed, uh, I think he's 2 of 5 on extra points so far this season. And he's missed a couple other kicks, I think. And they, they told him, we don't want you to retire. We, we still think you can do this. So apparently Frank Reich and Jim Irsay talked him out of retirement. He's going to go again. They've called him an instrumental leader on the team. And when they said that, I kind of thought, well, maybe they really want him around because they really need leaders on this team right now after Andrew Luck left. And if you lose Adam Vinatieri, who's been a pillar on that team for years and years, I, I, see, I could see how that could be another blow to that team. But if Adam Vinatieri struggles again in this game and... It comes down to the Colts maybe losing this game because of a kick that he missed. I, I'm sorry. I, I just don't see how you could argue that he should be sticking around. I'm sorry. I, I love Vinatieri, and I will wholeheartedly admit he's going to be a Hall of Famer one day. But if he's having issues and he can't figure them out and it's costing you games, it's it's time you cut ties. It just is. As hard as... As hard as that is for everybody to hear, it, it's just the fact. Um, but going on to who should win this game, I really struggled with trying to figure out who would win this game. I really did. I went back and forth for like 20 minutes trying to figure it out, and I've never struggled that hard this season on figuring out who should win a game. My heart says Colts win this game, but that's because I'm wholeheartedly biased towards them. I will admit that. But my brain says Falcons, and I, th I think the Falcons take this one. I think their aerial offense is just too much, and I, I, don't, I don't see how a rushing attack can go shot for shot with them. I just don't see it, especially if Marlon Mack isn't 100%. I'm going to go Falcons to win this one. But I, I do think the Colts could realistically win it. But I'm going to go Falcons. Should be a fun one, though. I think it'll be a close, fun game in the early afternoon. All right, moving on to Lions and Eagles. The undefeated 1-0-1 Detroit Lions. Say it while you can because you won't be able to say it for much longer. Taking on the 1-1 Philadelphia Eagles. All right, here's an interesting story that didn't really get talked about. Eagles canceled practice this Wednesday, uh, presumably because they didn't have enough healthy bodies to really go through a practice. We don't know if Deshaun Jackson and Alshon Jeffrey are going to be ready to go for this game in Philadelphia. So even if they are, I would assume Nelson Aguilar gets a lot of snaps at wide receiver. 
uh, and not just uh, at the wide receiver core is banged up. Carson Wentz, we still haven't heard a whole lot on how he's doing. I'm telling you, he did not look okay in that game against uh, Atlanta on this past Sunday night. He looked hurt, and we're going to see how healthy those ribs are. Uh, and the Lions are coming in off a huge gut check win off of the Chargers this past week. And you got to wonder, uh, will that Lions defense continue to be uh, stingy and stand up again against the banged up Philadelphia offense? Uh, for the Lions, though, their offense is really going to have to score more than 13 points in this game. I know that defense was good against the Chargers, and the Chargers are one thing. But now it's the Eagles in Philadelphia, and they're a little hurt. They might feel like they're a bit cornered right now, so their head coach is probably going to draw up some crazy trick plays for them. Uh, for the Lions offensively, they're going to need TJ Hawkinson, the tight end, to have a better game than he had in Week 2. Uh, they don't need him to go for 131 yards like he did in Week 1 but just a little bit better than, like, 30 yards, which is what I think he, what he had in Week 2. And Kenny Galladay, their stud wide receiver, is going to have to ball out, too, like he did in Week 2. But I think the Lions' undefeated season comes to an end in this game. <laughs> I've got the Eagles in this one. I am, I am worried, though, about how banged up they are because it's not really being talked about enough. It really feels like it's being underplayed how hurt they are right now. Because we saw it come into factor at the end of the Atlanta game, how those injuries just piled up and piled up. Uh, I mean, look at them right now. We're talking about maybe they don't have Dallas Goddard at tight end. Maybe they don't have two of their best wide receivers ready to go. Their defense on the defensive line is very thin right now. And it just feels like a recipe for a Lions team to go in there and just win it. It feels like it, but I just don't believe in the Lions being consistently good. I'm sorry. I live in Michigan, so I'm just used to the Lions letting people down. So I got Eagles in this one, but just keep an eye on this one. Just just keep an eye on it. Just like out of the corner of your eye, just, just keep an eye on it, because it might get weird. All right, All right moving on, we got uh, the a matchup of two one and one teams. Raiders at Vikings, and what well, looks to be an old, old school grinded out matchup. Uh... If you've noticed what the Raiders have been doing so far this year, they've been running Josh Jacobs a lot. And if you've been watching the Vikings, you know that the Vikings like to run it a lot and play defense under Gary Kubiak's system. Uh, basically, these two offenses are like, the less their quarterback has to throw, the better. And I know that sounds mean, but it's what they're trying to do. Uh Remember week one when Kirk Cousins only threw 10 passes for the Vikings and they won like 28 to like 14? That's like the Vikings' best case scenario of what they want. They just want to run, run, run with Dalvin Cook and get him to like 150 rushing yards a game, which is I think is what he's averaging. He So far, he leads the league with rushing with 265 yards. Uh... And the Raiders, if I remember correctly, Josh Jacobs needs like less than like a hundred yards to be like the fastest Raiders rookie running back to reach. Oh God, I can't even remember the stat. But he's been doing good so far. He's been doing good so far. Basically, is what I'm getting at. And I want to see how frisky the Raiders are going to be again, because you know they were they got Denver in Week One, and then they were hanging around with uh, the Chiefs. For, through the first quarter, they led ten nothing in the first quarter. So now they got to go on the road for the first time this year to Minnesota to play a team that just wants to run the ball on basically every down. Um, like I said, uh, the less that these quarterbacks do, the better. And it's it's getting really hard to love Kirk Cousins. It really is, especially after last week. I've been a big Kirk Cousins fan, but man, it's getting hard to love that guy. Uh. I'll take the Vikings in this one, though. I, I, I just think that defense is too much to overcome for Derek Carr in that offense, and I'll, I'll take the Vikings to go 2-1-1 over the Raiders. But this is, this is probably going to be a low-scoring, a uh, lot of grinded-out football. 
a good old Gruden grinder if you catch my drift. Now, see what I did there? Uh, but like I said, I'll take the Vikings in this one over the Raiders. Moving on to, in my opinion, the game of the weekend. I've got a little red star right next to it. So you, if, if you only watch one game this weekend, please let it be this game. I'm talking the 2-0 and Baltimore Ravens going to the 2-0 and Kansas City Chiefs. A matchup of two quarterbacks who have been lighting it up the entire season so far. This should be so much fun. And it's the home opener for the Chiefs. So you know that place is going to be packed. You know it's going to be loud. It's the only matchup the entire weekend of two teams that are undefeated. And by the end of this game, somebody's going to lose. Or God forbid there's a tie. Oh, God. Uh, we're going to see how good that Lamar Jackson-led offense really is. Can it go shot for shot with uh, Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs? Can it? I mean, these two teams played in Arrowhead last season, and it came down to the wire. Both quarterbacks are making phenomenal fourth down, uh, fourth quarter deep throws to their wide receivers. And that was the same game where Patrick Mahomes did, did the no-look pass that everybody does on highlight reels. Uh, I, it, I just really think this game is going to be fun. It's going to be so much fun. And, and here, here's the thing for you. If Lamar Jackson can go into Arrowhead and beat the reigning, defending NFL MVP and Patrick Mahomes and, and look great doing it, I think the Lamar Jackson for MVP height can officially begin. If I remember correctly, both quarterbacks ha are seven touchdowns to no interceptions so far this season, and they're probably going to throw a bunch in this game. I know the Ravens like to run it, but this is probably going to be a game where you're just going to have to sling it everywhere to keep pace with the with the Chiefs. And for the Chiefs offensively, who's going to be their wide receiver this week that has 170 yards receiving and three touchdowns? Because it was Sammy Watkins in week one, then it was Robinson in week two, so who's it going to be this week? Because it feels like it's just somebody else every single week gets over 150 receiving yards and three touchdowns. Uh, this game... Like last year when they played, I think it's going to come down to the fourth quarter. Uh, the Chiefs won it last year in Arrowhead. Uh, but I really think the Ravens could keep this close. And like I said, we're really going to find out how good they are. This is You're literally going up against the best offense in the entire league right now. So we're going to see if you can go shot for shot. And if they can't, it's not that bad. A, a, a lot of teams can't you know, put up 45 points at will like the Chiefs can. But if the Ravens can keep it close for most of the game, I think that's a win. We'll see how good the Ravens are. And like I said, I think this game comes down to who has the ball last. But like I said at the very first podcast, I'm not betting against the Chiefs at all this regular season. Chiefs win this one. But I would really like to see a Lamar Jackson win here. That could be that could really make things interesting if he can outduel Patrick Mahomes. Because these two guys have been lighting it up and just putting on a show these first two weeks. And I get that the Ravens have been doing it against lesser competition. Uh, they, they had the Dolphins in week one, then they had the Cardinals last week. But it's not like the Chiefs had much better competition. They had a Jags team that kind of gave up defensively. And then they had uh, the Raiders last week who just decided in the second quarter that they just weren't going to defend anything. So this is the first time that these two teams have really played, you know, real competition. You know, real, real good competition. But like I said, I got the Chiefs in this one. I, it'll, like I said, if you can only watch one game this weekend, make it this one. 1 o'clock Eastern. Wait, is it 1? It's either 1 or 425. I think it's 1. 1 o'clock Eastern. It's on CBS. There you go. Cheap, cheap plug for CBS. But watch that one. All right, moving on. I know for sure this game's at 4 Eastern. <laughs> <laughs> the 0-2 Giants going all the way to Tampa Bay to take on the 1-1 Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Uh, this this game is going to be very interesting for numerous reasons. Uh, the Giants benched uh, their future Hall of Fame quarterback, Eli Manning, this week for rookie Daniel Jones. It, it was a bit of a surprise, though. 
because you know Eli Eli's been doing what he's been doing the last three years. It's almost exactly what he's been doing the last three years. But now the Giants are like, okay, we've seen enough. That's just a little odd, in my opinion. And they start rookie Daniel Jones. They announce he was a starter on Wednesday. I think it was Wednesday. It was either Wednesday or Tuesday. On a short week, going all the way to Tampa Bay to take on a Todd Bowles-led defense who, like we mentioned uh, last Friday on the podcast, still knows how to get after offenses. And Todd Bowles is literally going to throw the kitchen sink at this kid. He is going to throw everything in his tool belt at this poor kid who is making his first NFL start. He's making his first regular season. Well, it's not his first regular season appearance because he played a little bit in week one. So at least he's got some action under his belt. But I, I, it, it might get ugly for the Giants offense. Uh, they're going to have to rely heavily on Saquon Barkley to help lead them. Uh, he's second in the league when rushing with uh, 227 yards so far this season. He's got o- over 100 yards in each game. And they're really going to have to rely on him uh, because the Giants are thin at wide receiver. Like we mentioned last Friday, I mean last Tuesday, that starting Daniel Jones isn't going to fix all the problems for this team. It's not going to fix the fact that uh, Golden Tate's out on a suspension. It's not going to fix the fact that the offensive line can't block. It's not going to fix the fact that this defense is horrifically atrocious. It's not going to fix the fact that Sterling Shepard's still in concussion protocol. It's not going to fix those things. It's just not. Uh, and this Giants team is probably still... Their outlook on the season is probably still the same as it was when Eli Manning was in there. Putting Daniel Jones in doesn't change much. It really doesn't. I hate to break it to everybody. The Giants aren't suddenly going to be an 8-win team. And they probably aren't even going to be a 6-win team. They're still probably staring down the barrel of a 4-win team. That's what this Giants team is. Uh, But speaking of that Giants defense, they're playing against Jameis Winston, who leads the league in turnovers since he came into the league in 2015. He had no turnovers on Thursday night, so you hope he can keep that up against a very bad Giants defense. And O.J. Howard, the tight end of Tampa Bay, he's gotten little production... And that's putting it lightly since Bruce Arians took over. And Bruce Arians said the production will come, but you, you got to worry about O.J. Howard down there. A uh, former tight end from the University of Alabama. First round pick by Tampa Bay like two years ago. He can play, he can play, but he just hasn't been getting... It seems like he just hasn't been getting production there this season. So we'll see if he can get it against a not good Giants defense. But I got the Bucks in this one. I, I just don't believe in the Giants whatsoever. And I, I just think in Daniel Jones' first start, Todd Bowles is going to throw the entire uh, arsenal at this kid and just try to overwhelm him as much as he can. Daniel Jones played great in the preseason, and that's really why he's starting, because he just he looked so great in the preseason, so they're going to give him a shot. Uh like I said, I got the Bucks winning this one. Moving on to uh, Panthers at Cardinals. I I was trying to figure out another game to recommend people to watch. And I really couldn't figure out a good one because we've already done two. Colts at Falcons, uh, Ravens at Chiefs. But I was keeping an eye on the news for Panthers at Cardinals because it sounds like for all intents and purposes... Cam Newton will more than likely not play in this game because of his ankle injury. Hasn't been to practice at all. It sounds like Kyle Allen, the backup there in Carolina, will get the nod. Now, this is important because this is going to get really interesting, and I need you to follow me on this one. Kyle Allen, in college, years ago, played at Texas A&M. At the same time as Kyler Murray, who is the current Arizona Cardinals quarterback. And before, I think it was the 2015 season, there was a quarterback competition to see who would get the starting job, Kyle Allen or Kyler Murray. Well, Kyle Allen wins as a quarterback competition, and the Texas A&M Aggies are starting out great. They're winning games. Allen's looking good. And then one 
game early in the season happens and Kyle Allen throws a couple picks. I don't remember who it was against, but he throws a couple picks and looks bad. Goes out the next week, has another bad week, and he gets benched for Kyler Murray. Well, season ends and Kyle Allen transfers to the University of Houston. And Kyler Murray, as you all know, would eventually go on to the University of Oklahoma, win the Heisman, get drafted number one overall by the Cardinals. And now, all of a sudden, he has to apparently go up against a guy who originally had beaten him in a quarterback competition in college. So I just think it's very interesting how all of this just leads back to Kyle Allen versus Kyler Murray. And that's why I think people should watch this game, just for that story alone. Just think of the narratives if either team wins. If Kyle Allen wins over the Heisman-winning quarterback who was drafted number one overall... Come, and Kyle Allen's coming off the bench to do it. That's a that's an interesting story. You know what else is an interesting story? If the Cardinals and their quarterback Kyler Murray get their first win of the season against Kyle Allen, who you know beat Kyler Murray, it's it's vindication on Kyler Murray's part. I mean, either way you look at it, no matter what happens in this game, it'll be vindication for somebody. Either the Panthers get their first win or the Cardinals get their first win. Uh, But speaking of the Cardinals' offense and Kyler Murray, they need to show up before the fourth quarter. They have to. It seems like the last two weeks, that's the only times they've been scoring touchdowns is in the fourth quarter. But they got to show up before then. you gotta, you got to stop this kicking field goal nonsense in every quarter except the fourth quarter when it feels like they just suddenly open things up. But even though they're not winning and they're not scoring a lot of points, their passing offense is ranked fourth in the league with 328 Point five passing yards a game. But the only problem with that is is that while their passing offense is great, uh, their defense is giving up 477.5 yards per game. That's 31st in the league so far this season. The, and, you, and you would hope that their defense would be better because they're facing Kyle Allen. Uh... In a home game in Arizona. So as long as you can keep... Remember, we talked about this last Friday on the podcast on how to shut down the Carolina offense. If you can just shut down Christian McCaffrey, that offense comes to a standstill, especially with a backup quarterback in there. So if the Cardinals defense can step up and try to keep uh, McCaffrey contained for as much as possible, they can win this game. And that's why I've got the Cardinals winning this one. They're going to go to 1-1-1. One, one, and one. Oh yeah, I know. Fancy, right? I'll take the cards in this one, but just keep an eye on it just for Kyle Allen versus Kyler Murray. I, I, I just really love that narrative. It's just interesting to me. But once again, I got the cards in this one. All right, moving on. We got the 1-1 one one Saints taking on the 2-0 and o Seahawks. It's Teddy time. Teddy Bridgewater time in New Orleans. The former uh, University of Louisville quarterback, drafted in the first round by Minnesota, was, I, in my opinion, a solid starter there in Minnesota. Took him to a playoff game. Should have won that playoff game. I think it was in 2015 or 16 against uh, the Seahawks if it wasn't for that shanked Blair Walsh kick. And then he suffered that horrific leg injury uh, that almost had his leg amputated while he was in Minnesota. Then he, after that, after he healed up, he got sent to the Jets, who then traded him to New Orleans. And now he's the starting quarterback in New Orleans because Drew Brees broke his thumb. Well, he didn't break his thumb. He tore some ligaments, but you get what I mean. And we're going to see what this Saints offense is going to do uh, because there was some indication earlier in the week that Sean Payton was alluding to a two-quarterback system for the offense, and everybody kind of lost their minds like, two quarterbacks, what craziness is this? But when you really think about it, the Saints have – been running a two-quarterback system for like the past two years with Taysom Hill. It just means that Taysom Hill's going to run in and take like a goal line snap. I do think we're probably going to see a bit more production to keep the defense, you know, on their toes from Taysom Hill. But I, 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 I found it weird just how everybody feels like they're just riding off Teddy Bridgewater already. Like this guy was a solid starter for the Vikings. He really was. And you're just going to throw in Taysom Hill to be the starter because he's run some gadget plays effectively? Like, really? Uh, before 
this past Thursday night football, the Saints led the league with nine sacks. And I feel like that's going to be a very decisive factor in this game because the Saints have been able to rush the passer so far. And the Seattle Seahawks offensive line has not been able to protect Russell Wilson. They've given up eight sacks so far this year, and that could be a deciding factor in this game. But remember initially when we talked about the uh, Drew Brees injury, I said that the Saints could realistically go 4-2 and two over their next six games. Uh, one of those losses being the Seattle Seahawks, and that's why I'm taking the Seahawks in this one. I just don't think that on a one-week thing, they're going to Seattle. It's Teddy just needs a bit more time to get the rust off, to get back into starting shape for his team, and that's why I'll take the Seahawks in this one. I'll take... I, I think the Seahawks might win this one by two touchdowns, but that doesn't mean the Saints are bad with Teddy. I just think it's a bit too much too soon kind of thing. But if the Seahawks, if the Saints want to stay in it, they have to get after Russell Wilson. Like I said, if they can get if they can do that, that could be a deciding factor in this game. All right, moving on, we got the 0-2 Steelers taking on the 2-0 49ers. Uh, the 49ers are averaging 36 points a game. That's third best in the league right now. 36 points a game so far for the 49ers. And they're going up against a Steelers team that's really kind of becoming a cornered animal very quickly. That trade for Minka Fitzpatrick that they pulled off really felt like a move a team would make. That's like one step away from being a playoff team. But the Steelers aren't that. They're starting Mason Rudolph. They're 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 0 and 2. They, this team isn't competing for the AFC North right now. They're just trying to compete to stay afloat. And their defense has been getting gashed so far this season, so you would hope that the Minka Fitzpatrick trade could help with that. Uh but I I wonder if the 49ers offense is too much for them. I mean, they had over 200 combined rushing yards last week. I know they won't do that every week, but still. They got a three-headed running... They got a true running back by committee system in San Francisco. It's a, some kind of weird three-headed monster. And not just their running game is solid. Their passing game is starting to come into its own. And uh, their head coach, Kyle Shanahan, said that Jimmy G is, is not only looking better now, but he's going to continue to look better. And that should terrify teams that this team isn't just a one-trick pony with the run game. They can throw the ball. Jimmy G was doing some solid dimes last week against Cincinnati. Uh, but on the opposite side of Jimmy G, you have Mason Rudolph, the Steelers quarterback, former uh, University of Oklahoma State quarterback, uh, making his first start in the league in his young two-year career. And the Steelers have talent offensively. They still got Juju Smith-Schuster. They still got James Conner, who says he should be good to go. They've got talent. They got a solid tight end in Vance McDonald, who caught two touchdowns last week. But they're going up against the 49ers defense, who has been turnover happy so far this season. They've just been generating turnovers in every game. And I'm really starting to buy into the 49ers, like I, like I am with the Bills. Uh, I've got the 49ers winning this one. I got the 49ers starting out 3-0, and and the Steelers fall into 0-3. I really think that the Steelers are going to... The Steelers still think they can win now. That's what that trade for Minka Fitzpatrick was. It was That's an indication that I think they think they can win now. And I think if they start 0-3 to 0-4, I, I think that's gonna that fight's going to leave them. All right, moving on to uh, our next game. Uh, the one and one Texans taking on the one and one Chargers in LA. All right, get this: the Bolts are averaging 444 yards per game. That's fourth in the league. 444 total yards a game, fourth in the league. 313 pass yards per game. That's eighth in the league, and 131 rush yards per game. That's ninth in the league. So basically, the Chargers' offense is a top ten offense right now. Uh, their defense, on the other hand, it, it's been a little, let's say, not there so far in each game. I mean, in the game against Detroit, they only allowed 13 points, which is good. But in their first game, they kind of choked when it mattered against the Colts. So you have to wonder if their defense can, you know, get a job done. Uh, so far, the Bolts only, I mean, the Chargers only have two sacks for the entire year. 
but they're going up against a Texans offensive line that's like averaging five sacks a game. So they might triple that number of total sacks by the end of the game. I know I've been hard on the Texans offensive line, but they deserve it. Uh, Deshaun Watson's going to keep him in this game. Like he does every single game he plays for the Texans. And if the Texans are hoping to win this game, they have to protect him. The Chargers have some mean blitzers on that line. Uh, like Joey Bosa, who will get after your quarterback, and he will make your quarterback cry. Uh, but for the Chargers offensively, you have to ask yourself, is Phillip Rivers going to throw another big fourth-quarter interception this week? He did it week one against the Colts, set up a game-winning, uh, not a game-winning, a game-tying touchdown try that, that set that game into overtime. He did it the net. He did it in week two against the Lions, and that interception actually costed them the game. So you have to ask yourself, is Phillip Rivers going to throw a back-breaking fourth-quarter interception for the third week in a row? You would hope he wouldn't. Phillip Rivers is one of the best quarterbacks in the league. He is. And just to see him do these boneheaded interceptions these last two weeks back-to-back is just really confusing. I, I thought Rivers was better than this. But in order for the Texans to win this game, they have to protect Deshaun Watson, and I just do not have faith in them doing that, especially with word coming out of Houston that Larry Me Tunsil's a bit banged up, their left tackle that they traded for. And that's why I'm going to say the Chargers win this one. I think the Chargers are just going to be a bit too much for the Texans to handle. Watson's going to keep them in it like he does every single game, but it's just going to be way too much for the Texans to handle to try and protect Deshaun Watson. I got the Chargers winning this one. All right, moving on to the Sunday night football game. Uh, the 2-0 Rams going all the way to Cleveland to take on the 1-1 one one Browns. It's the first Sunday night football game appearance for the Cleveland Browns since 2008, I think week two of that season. And uh, Cleveland's still figuring things out offensively. Uh, David Njoku, their tight end, broke his hand in the Monday night game against the Jets this past Monday night. And he's going to be out for at least a month, it sounds like. So that's a big blow to an offense that's really just trying to put things together and figure it out. Uh, and I remember when this game was announced, I thought, oh, this is perfect. We get Baker in prime time. Uh, we'll, we'll get to see him go toe-to-toe with, uh, with the Rams and find out how good this Cleveland offense is. And, and now we're getting closer to it, and I'm like, I really don't know if I want to watch this game because... The Browns are still struggling offensively, and defensively, it feels like the Rams are just going to pick them apart. The Rams are the new alpha of the NFC now that the Saints are gone. They've they've laid claim to everything in the NFC. They're they're the new god there. There's nothing that can stop them right now for like the next seven weeks. Uh, and I I just think that. I don't, I'm not. I'm not sure. I, I want to believe in the Browns. I really, really want to believe in the Browns, but they're just making it so hard to right now. Their offensive line is banged up, and you would think Aaron Donald would just take advantage of that and just go on a rampage against Sam, uh, against Baker Mayfield. But Aaron Donald's a bit banged up right now. It sounds like uh, it's his back, with the word coming out of Los Angeles, so far. He's a bit banged up right now, so we'll see how healthy he is if he can go Sunday night. Uh, this game might get ugly fast. I'm just going to be honest with you. It might get ugly fast. Uh, I really want to believe in Cleveland. I really do because that fan base deserves a winner. And they really deserve a nice little primetime win like this. I mean, Monday night, a lot of the prestige has been knocked off Monday night football. I think we can all agree there. Sunday night football is the big primetime game for everybody. And the Cleveland fans, they really deserve a big win against a big opponent on a Sunday night game. They, they just deserve it. But I don't think they're going to get it. I'm going to take the Rams in this one. Like I said, this one might get ugly fast. Uh, I think the Rams are going to just come out and just dominate from beginning to end. It this, this has the feeling of one of those games that you probably turn off at halftime. One of those games. All right, moving on to the last game on our slate, the Monday night game. You got the Chicago Bears going all the way to Washington to take on the Washington football team. 
And the Bears' defense is legit. They are legit. If I remember correctly, they're they're averaging about 12.4 points a game that they've given up so far. And that's incredible. The defense looks to be almost as good as it was last year. And a lot of the people said it wouldn't be close to that good again. But it, so far, it looks like they're going to be that good. On the other hand, the Bears' defense is legit. The Bears' offense is the exact opposite of legit. The Bears offensively have only scored one touchdown this season. One. One. You know which other team in the league has only scored one touchdown so far this season? It's the Dolphins. You never, ever want to be compared to the Dolphins right now. It's You don't want that. It's bad. You don't want that. It's bad. Uh, Matt Nagy, the Bears head coach, said he believes that the Bears' offensive struggles are just temporary right now. And it sounds like he's really trying to sell that, but I don't I don't know. I really don't believe in Mitch Trubisky as a quarterback right now. And yes, while the Washington defense is very suspect, at least their offense can put up points. They're, they've scored over 20 points in each of the games so far. And I think the Bears only their highest output total for offense was like 16 points, and that was like last week. The Bears offensively are not good right now. Oh, here you go. The Bears average are averaging offensively 9.5 points per game offensively. the Wa- The Washington football team is averaging 24. And yeah, the Bears' defense is going to keep them in it, and they're going to drastically limit what Washington can do offensively. But they can't hold them the entire game. They just can't. And yes, Chicago has a kicker, and yeah, he can probably make like four to five field goals to maybe squeak out a win. But that offense has to do something for Chicago. And if they have another really bad performance offensively, where Trubisky just is not helping anything and he's not getting the job done... It's it's going to get very loud in Chicago. It's, it's, it's The Boo Birds are going to be very loud. Even though the game's in Washington, people are going to be very upset back home in Chicago. But I'm going to call an upset here. I think Washington wins this one. I think the Bears' defense is going to get tired late in the game, and Washington's going to eke out a last-second touchdown that the Bears just don't have an answer for because their offense can't do anything right now. I'll take Washington to win this one. All right, that concludes uh, our week three preview. Just went through every game. Next time you hear from me, it'll be Tuesday where we're going to recap every game we just previewed, catch up on any news, and set you up for Thursday Night Football next week. Listen, I know Thursday Night Football was not good, but you go through games like Jacksonville and Tennessee to get games like we're getting next Thursday night. Packers and Eagles. You sit through bad Thursday Night Football to get good Thursday Night Football. That's what it's all about, man. So like I said, next time you hear from me, it'll be Tuesday where we'll do our recap show. Uh, Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Uh, We got our little uh, social media details down below in the description box, so make sure to check those out. And I hope you have a fun week three. Hope you enjoy it. Uh, All right. See you next time. Bye.